Hello and welcome to Model Kit Beginner. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm uh, doing all right. Had a bit of a rough week, but uh, on the mend. And today we have a look at something rather unusual, special. A Stutz or Stutz. I call it Stutz because the name sounds rather German or Austrian to me. It's a Stutz racer, Auto de Course, and. Uh, about the history we'll talk about a little bit later on the kit and and maybe the car itself as well quite quite interesting so but this is one of the Roland what were you thinking kits why would you buy this this is an old Lindbergh kit you know this will only be trouble yeah yes just like this old cars I like I like these vintage pre-world war one cars I mean just look at the box art I mean just look at it I mean, it's just amazing. This is where men were men and women were glad of it. Iron Man wooden ships. Yeah, that was awesome, 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 awesome. So I love this. Uh, the kit looks interesting. We'll have a look at it together. But before we're going to have a look at it, let's quickly have a look at the history of the kit, which is rather brief. And maybe a little rundown the history of uh, Stutz or Stutz itself. I'll see you there on the other side. And here we are having a look at the Stutz racer Auto de Course 116 from the fine folks over at the now defunct Lindbergh. Now you can see this one, this is the uh, second version which came out in 2009 as a new box apparently it has plastic sprues and uh, decal sheets don't see anything about tires or windows well it doesn't have any does it and uh, you see the original kit looked like this so very same same box art if you want so just this part here is white where on the one which i just showed you which we are having a look at it is black right but uh, Stutz obviously was a car company who made uh, first of all racing cars it was Stutz and Mercer who threw stones at each other they were the big uh, competitors in the early racing uh, um, time uh, it was a uh, Stutz racer against the Mercer ra race about I'm sure you all know the Mercer race about I think we had a look at it and uh, look at one of my uh, reviews of a 132 Mercer race about so you know what that one looks like and Stutz was one of its biggest competitors. Stutz was around from 1911 building racing cars and then uh, from after World War One they started then building high-end luxury cars and that went uh, well I think till 1935 some of you might know there was a bit of a depression uh, in between between 20 from 29 onwards till the mid 30s and a lot of the luxury marks obviously we are not the cars which people could buy then at the time or even if you would drive around in one of those people would throw rocks at you so the Duesenbergs went the Stutz went a lot of the luxury marks went out of business Stutz was one of them here you can see a, a real one this is a civilian version if you want so it is the luxury version because it has the monocle window. Look at this. Yeah, 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 yeah. You are protected here. They're, they're looking after you. Not a problem. And then obviously what I always like are these period photos. This looks like in the Indianapolis. Uh, I think it's Mr. Stutz here at the back. I have another one there. You can see him again. And then obviously you have uh, Gilbert Anderson as the driver and Frank Agen as the mechanic yeah they obviously had their six-point uh, safety harnesses so there was no way they would fall out there no no they didn't they didn't have any of that some of them drove with cigars or pipes burning and uh, that was a tank is uh, safely located right behind them and in front of them obviously a very very big engine right that's more or less uh, what I can tell you about the Stutz. Lovely, lovely, lovely car, lovely history, old racing car 
from the days, this one, 1914, just at the beginning of World War I. And uh, yeah, a legendary, just a legendary car company. Right, I would say uh, let's have a look uh, what is in the box, if that is also as legendary. Only one way to find out. I'll see you down at the bench. Right, and here we are with the Stutzreiser Autobahn from Lindbergh. As it says, 116, it's a static model. What do you mean? It doesn't even have a functioning engine. Apparently, it must be at least 14 years of age. And it is made in the USA. You need blue, and it is more challenging plus stimulant. Can't wait for to see that. Right, let's have a look what's on the side. Here you go, that is a ready-built model. Nice and clean with the number 27 on there. Here we go, it is 27, that's how it should be. Then we have the box art, we have the same more or less here. Gives you a bit of a, an idea how to build this. You can see the box has been through the walls as well. It's been around for a bit. And then at the back, more or less the same, tells you that it is nearly 23 centimeters or 9 inches in length. This uh, particular one apparently is uh, distributed through International Hobbycraft UK LTD. Hopefully they are still around. It says it is an authentic model. That's what it says here in German. And uh, I'm very glad to hear that. So let's open it up. It has a flip open lid. Very, very nice. We have the instruction sheet. We have two bags of plastic. And we do have a decal sheet. They weren't over promising. Not at all. It is in here. Right, let's get all of this out. Let's put the box to one side. Maybe I should have made some space here next to me. There we go. Done. Right. And as usual, we go through the instructions first, which shouldn't take us too long. You can see these are fold-out instructions. It gives you the before beginning, read through everything carefully, which obviously we will do. And um, that's basically what it says here. Here it gives you the colors. All in all, there's a color call out for five colors. So you should be all right with your basic colors with red, black, silver, brass, and brown. Then we start with the engine. And uh, it shows you the drawings are a bit rudimentary, but it gives you in English as well as in French a very good point by point uh, instruction how to build this. So that shouldn't be too difficult. You should be able to follow that if you speak either English or French. Otherwise, just try to Google translate it for you. Then we are here, number three comes together and then uh, gives you again step by step instructions. Then we have the final uh, assembly right over here, tires, spare tires, etc. And then, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. There we go. We have done the instructions, all of them. It's, uh, it's not overpowering. Then uh, let's have a look at the decals. The decals basically consists of, now let's, uh, let's get a bit closer here. Shall we? There we go. Right, the decals are white decals of numbers. And in this case, it is the number 27 and a Stutz written out and a Stutz logo right over here. That's about it. No, 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 no dashboard decals. It wasn't much of a dashboard, let's be honest. And no, there are no dashboard decals. Then let's start. Normally we go to the transparent parts. Oh, there aren't any. We go to the tires. Well, there are tires, but they are somewhat different than what we might be used to. 
Yep. A good friend of mine told me you bought yourself a whole box of hurts. No, 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 it's not that bad. Not that bad. Here we go. So this is... These are the wheels. And the tires and the rims are all in one. So which means you will have to... Uh, be careful when paint this and obviously have to uh, mask this very carefully. Now there's quite an edge, so that shouldn't be that difficult. You should be able to do that quite comfortably. And then you obviously have to paint uh, the uh, rims differently from the tires, otherwise it kind of looks funny. Anyway, these are the tires, no vinyl, all styrene. Um, Everything has uh, quite a good uh, amount of seams, but if you look inside here, not many. So these, by the way, are the back tires because it, I think it was chain driven. These are the front tires, obviously no brakes, no brakes on the front. That uh, did not exist, uh, only rear brakes, mechanical linkage rear brakes. Here we go. So the plastic, yes, there are seams, but there's no flash. There's no flash, so that's pretty cool. So uh, here we are. That uh, will be the tires. Now the rest of the plastic is in a bag itself altogether. Right over here. Seems to be... Uh, glued together maybe by the previous owner I don't know or maybe it comes like that anyway very good to cut open the whole bag full of parts and let's go and have a look at them here we have a piece of sprue with nothing on it you never know when you need that um, uh, let's have a look here. what are we having here? here we go here's a sprue with Leaf springs. I would assume these are for the rear. Here we have, I would say, brakes. And then we have the wheel nuts right over here with a spare one, it appears. If it is, then the wheel nuts. What do you think? Give me your, give me your assessment here. There we go. Just to see, there is a detail on the, the leaf springs. Actually, not bad at all. And as I said, it is 1 to 16, so it's not fiddly as such. Because you can't say anything about the fitment. You will hear that in one of the bench updates once I start building that. Right, then we have the uh, drive shaft with the differential. Very nice. Not bad. Again, Obviously, some seams on it. Here we have the uh, steering column, I would assume. Um, some steering stabilizer. There's These are the front leaf springs, if I am not totally wrong, and I'm sure I'm not. Front leaf springs, that's how they were bouncing around. And uh, they had what they called... Uh, well, they had their own form of shop absorbers, which they called dampeners, were kind of wooden discs, which you could uh, then set with a screw how hard they should, uh, um, you know, scrunch against each other, how hard the friction should be. That's why they called them friction dampeners. Here we got the words do come eventually. And those friction dampeners were obviously took the place of shock absorbers. So you wouldn't bounce around in your car like you were on a pogo stick. Well, it worked more or less all right, but it certainly was better than having nothing. But I haven't seen any of these here. Right, engine, engine half, right over here. This looks like a four-cylinder. It probably is. And I'll find out and I'll let you know once, uh, once we get to the end. And I'll give you my summary. It probably is a 10 litre engine or something stupid like that with four cylinders. Can it be? If they had that in those days. I remember they had 12 litre engines with six and four cylinders, cylinders as big as a coffee can. But I'll, I'll let you know exactly what kind of engine is in here. Um, uh, 
once we get back up to the bench. You know, I'm, uh, it tickled my fancy now. I really would like to know what kind of engine it is. In those days, if you want to have more power, you just needed to have a bigger engine. It was as simple as that. Sometimes they just took yeah, plain engines, simple as that. 18 liters, 24 liters, crazy stuff. Anyway, I'll let you know how big this one is quite a huge not particularly detailed look there wasn't a lot of detail on it on there let's let's be honest but yeah not very very detailed so you can obviously then start putting a bit more detail on it yourself and why wouldn't you and we have to take the body parts just now here we have the steering wheel that looks pretty authentic some uh, the starter yeah, there was an electric. It doesn't matter how big the engine was and how big the cylinders you started and cranked it by hand. Obviously, the compression wasn't 10 to 1 or something, but maybe 3.5, 4 to 1, if you're lucky. But anyway, it was still quite something to crank these engines and the arm could be broken. And here we have, you remember, I told you about the dampness. Here we have a... Let's try to get the light away from it a little bit. Yeah, you get an idea of the dampeners. They were wooden discs and there was a screw in the middle which you tightened or loosened and this is how you could sit your dampeners or your shock absorbers, if you want to call them like that. And that's how they worked. Then we have another differential. Now, this looks like the front axle which is nearly falling off. But I just had a differential, didn't I? Hmm. Interesting. This is a differential and maybe an extra drive shaft over here. I don't know. I don't know. Not quite sure why we have two differentials. I'm sure it's not a four wheel drive. No, it's certainly not because there's the front axle. So, yeah, we just seem to, for some other reason, seem to have two different differentials. This seems to be a bit more detailed, but it doesn't have a drive shaft. So, but that is uh, quickly constructed, so that's probably what I will be going for. It has, however, the uh, gear lever and the handbrake, which you'll see right over here. Here we go. And uh, this, I think, is probably updraft carburetor. What do you think? Or is that the exhaust side? Probably the exhaust. No, the exhaust side comes in there. So this is the updraft carburetor because in those days they didn't have downdraft carburetors because the seals weren't very good. If you would have a downdraft carburetor, let it sit overnight, all the petrol in the carburetor would drip into the cylinders. Started the next morning, you could crack the engine because you had suddenly liquid in there which you shouldn't have. So that's why they had side draft carburetors in those days. And when you wanted to cold start, you had a little thing at the top a little screw a little bowl where you could drip in a little bit of petrol to help you cold start the engine right and obviously your tank was worked with vacuum so you had a vacuum pump in the car like a bicycle pump basically where you pump pressure into your tank and that pressure would then put the petrol in front to the engine and once you were driving you had a little pump in the car which would then automatically keep the pressure up in the tank and would get your petrol in front to the engine. And later on, um, when the more fancy cars, you even had a little coffee can, like a quarter of a gallon or liter, liter and a half, a uh, little tank in the engine bay where the petrol would be pumped into and then from there would be uh, distributed to the uh, to the carburetor but that was very fancy 1914 there's there put up some pressure in the petrol tank and the petrol would be distributed with this air pressure front to the engine through an updraft carburetor right then we have well, here is the exhaust side of things there you go that's an exhaust look at that yeah needs a quite a bit of a clean up but yeah look, it's big enough it's no problem cleaning this up there's no fiddly work here you can just go for it 
we have oh look at that there even is a bit of a structure at the bottom for the wooden floor which it without a doubt had quite a few location points biggish ones and there's the bottom which doesn't look uh, yeah there's nothing there's nothing here really um uh, there's no wood which should be here there's nothing no pipes no nothing so the Lindbergh kept it very simple there so there is some uh, place for uh you can do some uh improvements details then you have this there which is for the tank which i see right over here here's the tank let's put that together so it gives us an idea of the fitment ah oh, seems to be fitting all rightish that would then go here there we go there you have the tank actually has two holes not quite sure so but the tank then go here no 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 oh these are just here to make sure that your tank is centered and that obviously I'm sure there's a cap there so there's where your tank goes as i said uh, safely located right behind the driver and the mechanic then here we have the dashboard take that away i guess the uh, details dashboard right over here obviously on the steering wheel you normally had the lever where you could retard or advance your ignition and you normally also had a kind of a gas or petrol depending where you're from lever so uh, where you can could call it an early um, uh, speed control if you want so but yeah that's uh, how it was I've seen, I was still driving tractors who had those and probably still have those today hand levers for your power then uh, some instruments right over here here's the switch um, uh, which is normally I would assume is a switch you switch between uh, normal ignition and magneto obviously a good magneto makes a good spark but very difficult to get going right at the beginning it needs a couple of revolutions so you could switch between a battery ignition when those batteries obviously only lasted a minute or two and then once the engine was running you switched over to your magneto and that would then provide the spark through the spark plugs into your engine here we have the seats and uh, this is how they were they look pretty authentic driver and mechanic here this is actually quite cool the mechanic and the driver have the same seats they never sit next to each other they always sit kind of apart a little bit uh, like that you know one in front of the other in order that the uh, driver would not elbow the mechanic or vice versa because there wasn't a lot of space for the two once they were in the car then this is the uh, boot if you want so i'm sure it was full of tools because in those days you had to change tires all the time you had to help yourself so this is where that went then we have the cowl in front i'm sure this is where the radiator goes right over here or maybe not no it's not it's probably where the rest goes probably at the back here here we go that that's normally where I show you go but it needs a bit of a cleanup so this is where this goes so this is where your instrument panel goes and then your radiator goes right over here here we go let's try to fit that in see if that works yeah it needs a bit of a cleanup but otherwise it would work so there's your radiator right over here normally it would have uh, see it it just about fits in needs a bit of a cleanup but then you should be able to fit it in quite nicely it doesn't have what we call a a water meter or temperature meter which was a a little glass which showed you how hot uh, the water in your engine was so if he already had a temperature reader in the car itself not sure those days uh, both uh, methods were still applicable i think 1914 he should have a one of these water temperature meters which goes onto the cap of the radiator not in here the uh, belts are nicely detailed 
be nice if they would have been apart and you could have painted them but as, as it is they are not and you'll paint them afterwards and have this uh, all very nicely masked that's how we do it and that is it these are all the parts you will find in the 116 studs racer it's a bear cat by the way here we go a very uncomplicated kit i think we can say uh, quite safely but uh, not a bad kit uh, fitment is as expected for a Lindbergh kit from the 70s not unbuildable and if you like the subject like i do and uh, you know just go overboard because you love it so much then it shouldn't be a problem at all i'm certainly looking forward building it so let's get, go up back uh, to the bench because i would love to tell you a little bit more about that engine that has me now triggered and i'll give you my final thoughts see you there So here we are back upstairs and I read up a little bit about the engine. It had a 390 uh, straight four cylinder. So we have looked right. It is a four cylinder engine. Probably had eight or 12 spark plugs in those days. They packed them full of spark plugs to make sure they get some sort of spark. So uh, that's one about what 6.4 liters for our European friends. So that's what it was. So 6.4 liters, four cylinders. So these were big cylinders. And it certainly made round about 60 horsepowers and enough torque to crawl up a building. I can tell you that for nothing. But anyway, there were amazing cars driven by amazing, amazing hero gentlemen. Because, geez, you had to be crazy to drive one of those fast. And they certainly were on those tires and with those engines. No safety whatsoever. And off they went amazing amazing times anyway i'm looking forward to building this it is a simple kit yes but i think it will build up very very nicely and you can go crazy and uh, do it in race livery and whether it and oh, i i have a couple of ideas already for this so i think this will be a great great build well thanks very much for popping in hope you enjoy and 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 uh, share my enthusiasm or maybe you just think I'm totally off the rocker to even have bought this. That's also fine. We are all different. Thanks very much for popping in. That's the most important thing for me. Down there you will find the link to my Facebook page and to Grumpy's Bazaar page if you want to buy a model. And uh, otherwise, um, thanks very much for popping in. And greetings from Cape Town. Cheers. <laughs>